You're so strange, like I want to cry. And I'm like, yo, yo, man, what's happening to me? Despite the things you think you know, the most important thing is, the captain is back. Hey guys, Trip here. If you're anything like me, you've probably been watching the Cyberpunk gameplay video on a loop for several weeks. After years of silence and secrecy, we finally caught our first glimpse of CD Projekt Red's latest RPG. And even a hopeless cynic like me has to admit, it's pretty impressive so far. But amidst all the hype, you may have forgotten a small but important detail. The world of Cyberpunk is terrifying. Now I know what you're thinking. It's the cyberpunk genre. You'd expect things to be a little dystopian. But it's rare that I see a gameplay video so full of lore, details, and world building, so proud and unapologetic of its own world, and so immersive with its gritty atmosphere. This video was dense, and all these little details were meant to leave you with a very specific impression. Night City is fucking scary. In this video, I want to analyze what made the cyberpunk video so effective, what its focus was, what its goal was, and how it achieved these goals through narrative, context, and atmosphere. So what makes the world of Night City so terrifying? How did the video get this message across? What can it teach us about world building? Well, let's take a look. The video begins with a missing persons case. The player's character named V is sent on a mission to rescue a girl kidnapped for her cybernetics. What follows is a shootout worthy of any modern FPS, but it's the world building in this scene that really got me intrigued. Turns out, if you're one of the super rich, you get access to a militarized platinum healthcare plan. You get a chip in your brain that tracks your location at all times, and if you ever suffer serious illness or injury, a trauma team will be flown to your location. These medics are armed and authorized to kill anyone who gets in their way. After the player fixes the tracking device in the victim's head, the trauma team arrives in minutes. Once they land on the scene, they treat the player like garbage and threaten to shoot her if she gets too close. This is when things really started getting interesting for me. The way they dehumanize the life of the player while treating their client like a queen is one of the most impactful moments of the video. And we learn so much about this world in just the first scene. In Night City, your life is worthless unless you're wealthy. Crime is so widespread that even the doctors carry assault rifles. The concept of privacy is an afterthought, with people willingly plugging tracking devices into their brains. Welcome to Night City. You don't want to live here. But wait, let's step back for a moment. We just found a naked woman in a bathtub. Gangsters were about to strip her for parts like a used car. Why would the super rich hire two mercenaries to rescue who I assume is their daughter? Where the hell are the police? If you paid attention to the video, you were probably asking this question a lot. At no point in this initial quest are the police even referenced. No one bothers to call them. No one is afraid of them barging in on a shootout in an apartment complex. When the paramedics arrive, there's no SWAT team or even a beat cop to support them. Hell, even a drive-by shooting in broad daylight isn't enough to get the cops on your tail. Indeed, whether it's shady mercenaries, armed paramedics, or private military contractors, it seems the free market has largely replaced the police. Sure, we see one or two in the video, but they're barely a factor. Not only that, but according to the lore, most police forces are funded by private entities. In the world of cyberpunk, the cops don't answer to the people or even the government. They answer to the highest bidder. Even at the end of the video, after a major shootout in an abandoned warehouse, there isn't a cop in sight. Instead, we're confronted with the city's true masters. So with this apparent vacuum left by the government, who's running things? I'll give you one guess. Night City is a plutocracy. While this is a common theme in the cyberpunk genre, the video made sure to hammer this in at every turn. Corporations control industry, the government, and most importantly, the law. Not only that, but according to the lore, the corporations funded the construction of Night City. They literally own this town. When the player first encounters these corpos, they're equipped with armored cars, advanced cybernetics, and a small army of guards. The player tries to strike a deal with these guys, but she's quickly overwhelmed. 
They immediately interrogate the player and even threaten to murder her if she doesn't cooperate. They've also kidnapped one of their co-workers who they suspect has double-crossed them. This is just an average Tuesday for these guys. The entire time, the lady in charge appears to be scared, anxious, strung out even. She's not afraid of the law. She's afraid of her bosses. After they effortlessly hack the player's brain to determine if she's lying, they form an uneasy truce. The corpo boss sends you into a death trap, which results in dozens of casualties. After the bloodbath, she appears with an armed convoy to congratulate you. She encourages you to work with them in the future. If you do, then one day you might be as successful as her. The boss leaves the player with some parting words that sum up the world of cyberpunk. Only the corp gets what it wants. But we all expect this stuff from a cyberpunk game. Militarized healthcare, societal decay, anarcho-capitalism. There's nothing particularly surprising here. But it's the execution that separates this game from the pack. That's the reason I wanted to make this video. Not just to explain what they did, but to explain why it matters. So many games are eager to explain their world building to me, to tell me things that are happening elsewhere, or talk about amazing things that have happened in the past that we'll never see in the present. These games lack the confidence, the competence, and the balls to actually show me their worlds. So many game worlds feel timid, they feel afraid to really embrace what they're all about out of some misguided fear that they'll scare people off if they're too different or unique or interesting. Well, in this 48 minute video, I have felt more immersed in the world that they're creating than I have in most open world RPGs I've actually played. I feel like I know this place. I feel like even though this place is so different, so unrelatable, so divorced from my own reality, I can still see the relatability. I can still place myself in somebody's shoes and imagine what I would do in these situations, who I would be in these situations. And that is what I want out of a role-playing game. So what did they get right that so many others get wrong? Well, there's a lot of things I could bring up, but it really comes down to this. It is dense. Every frame of this video, every line of dialogue, every billboard, advertisement, and even the people walking around on the street contribute to the game's overall atmosphere. Nothing is wasted. Everything we saw in that video served to further immerse us into the world, to show us how this society works. All the little things, from the fact that V has a vending machine in her own apartment, to the advertisements that are wired into her brain, to the blatant sex and violence on billboards, to the guy on the street trying to sell you a fucking snuff film, it all forms a focused, cohesive whole. With such a dense, immersive atmosphere, things that wouldn't even phase you, that you wouldn't even think about in other video games, suddenly take on a new meaning. In a typical open-world, city-based game, you wouldn't even bat an eye at gangsters with assault rifles or rocket launchers. But once a world has sold you on its lore, you start to take it a bit more seriously. You start to question how a society got to this point. Every cyberpunk game has corporations that rule the world, but now you really feel like you're in the shoes of someone being stepped on by the people above them. I was more intimidated by those corporate goons than I ever was by Alduin and Skyrim. And I haven't even played the damn game yet. That's the power of good world building. It's what happens when you're confident, unapologetic, and unafraid. For some contrast, let's take a look at a typical Bethesda RPG. When you look at a game world like Cyrodiil in the Elder Scrolls Oblivion, you see a world that's afraid to come out of its shell, that's afraid to be anything different from what was popular at the time. The diverse cultures, the fantastical environments, the very identity of Cyrodiil was whitewashed with the coming of Oblivion. As a result, Cyrodiil has no personality outside of the same basic tropes we see all the time in fantasy. Without an identity, without a goal, without a clear theme in mind, your world will fall flat. Everything this video got right is something Bethesda games get wrong. Sure, Oblivion was a success despite all this. It's one of my favorite games of all time. But did it have to sacrifice its world to be popular? 
The most common counter argument I hear is that if a world is too intense, too strange, too focused in one area as opposed to another, that it might scare people off. The crux of this argument is that a game won't be popular unless its world is safe and familiar. And this brings us back to Cyberpunk. Sure, you could argue that Cyberpunk's world is familiar, but I don't think anyone could say that this shit is safe. But for all the horrors of Night City, I gotta say, I never felt depressed or intimidated by the world. It somehow managed to strike a balance between total grimdark cynicism and a sort of optimistic ambition. Honestly, it's just like what the narrator in the trailer said. Night City is a terrible place, but everyone wants to be there. I'm still sucked in by the lights, the glitz, the glamour, the celebrities, the music playing on the radio. I suddenly feel like a rebellious punk trying to fight the system, or an ambitious yuppie trying to climb the corporate ladder however I can. In short, they manage to make a world that's both terrifying and strangely inviting. And I gotta say, that's a hard thing to do. Without sacrificing the uniqueness of their world, they've still managed to open themselves up to a wider audience. That's a lesson a lot of companies can learn from. But what can we learn from all this? What can CD Projekt Red teach us about world building? Well, for me, the most important takeaway is that we don't need to settle for mediocrity. We don't need to settle for blandness in our world building. Whether you're a consumer or a creator, don't let anybody tell you that an IP needs to be safe to be successful. I mean, sure, different things will resonate with different people, but sacrificing your creativity is rarely the right answer. A world will rise and fall on its consistency, on its authenticity, on its use of character, on its writing, on the way it resonates with the basic human condition. But the worlds that really stick with me are the ones that manage to do all of that, while sparking my creativity, while showing me something I've never seen before, or something I have seen before in a way I've never seen before. And most importantly, they do all of this without sacrificing their unique voice. Night City is fucking terrifying, and I wouldn't have it any other way. But hey, that's just my opinion. Hey guys, Trip here. If you liked that video, why not watch some more? Hit that like button and make sure to share this video on Reddit and social media. Have you ever wanted to wear my face like a grizzly pelt? Well, check out Rage On. There you'll find all sorts of Psycho Trip merchandise to satisfy your grim needs. Contrary to popular belief, I am not a plutocrat and lack the money to fund my schemes. Together, we can fix this. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.